Okay, so hello everyone. Maybe it's time to start uh, this first webinar of the Combinator Seminar of Rainy Institute. Um, I will talk about some saturation problems, and this is joint work with uh, Balash Kessag, Nathan Lemons, Ryan Martin, and Demeter Pavelgi. So, okay. Um, so a little bit about saturation problems. So in my view, they are little brothers of extremal problems. So in extremal problems, we are looking for largest combinatorial objects having uh, some kind of properties, some prescribed properties, uh, as opposed to saturation problems. And we are looking for minimum sized graphs, hypergraphs, or uh, uh, set families with some prescribed property. Okay. so. Let's see some examples. The property of being a triangle free graph. We know from the famous theorem of Montel that if we have an n vertex triangle free graph, then it can have not more than n squared over four edges. This is sharp as shown by the balanced bipartite graph. And so this is the extremal problem. And the corresponding saturation problem asks for the minimum number of edges. Uh, that an n vertex graph should have such that the graph itself doesn't contain a triangle, but no matter how we add um, any edge that is not there, then this new edge will indeed um, give us uh, a triangle. And this number is n minus one. This is shown by, for example, by the star. If we add, I mean, so it's k1 n minus one, if you want to have it in a formal way. So the complete bipartite uh, graph with part size one and n minus one. Um, and this is minimum possible because if you have less edges in a graph on n vertices, then it's not going to be connected. So if you add an edge that joins two different components, then definitely no cycles. So in particular, no triangle will uh, be created. Okay, uh, for graphs in general, so not only uh, for triangle free graphs, uh, but if we forbid a graph F and the extreme problem is that what's the most number of edges that we can have without creating a copy of F, then this is uh, settled more or less, uh, at least for non bipartite graphs by the Erdős Ton Simonovich theorem. Uh, the answer is quadratic. And uh, we also know that uh, this extremal number is linear if and only if the graph, the forbidden graph F is a forest. And um, the corresponding saturation problem is that now we forbid the graphs, well, in my slides, it is now denoted by G. So what we want is the minimum number of edges in a graph with n vertices such that it doesn't contain g, but any addition of, of, a, of a new edge would create a copy of g. And Kassonian Tuza in 1986 showed that no matter what the graph g is, it's always to, it's, it, it is always possible to create such a saturating graph, g saturating graph, uh, with a linear number of edges. Uh, what about hypergraphs or k graphs, k uniform hypergraphs? Well, in this case, the Turan problem is very much unsolved, so we don't know too much about the extremal problem, and we don't know the exact values for most of the uh, for the saturation problem. But we have a result by Pikulko, which is an extension of the Kasanyi Tusa result. So observe that if we are talking about k graphs, so k uniform hypergraphs, then the total number of possible hyperedges is, of course, n choose k. So the order of magnitude is n to the k, and Picorco's result says that no matter what the forbidden hypergraph H is, uh, one can always create a hypergraph on n vertices with big O n to the k minus one uh, many hyperedges, such that the, this hypergraph doesn't contain H, but adding any new hyperedge would create a copy of H. Okay. So let's get closer to our topic today, forbidden subset problems. So Spurner's theorem is one of the theorems, one of the two theorems that are 
always on my slides. The other one is Erdos Korodo. Well, today it's Sperner because I'm talking about uh, containment results. So what does it say, the theorem of Sperner from 1928? It says that if we try to gather as many sets as possible, uh, I mean, as many subsets of, um, of an n-element ground set as possible without having to one containing the other, then the best one can do is, or what can get is n choose n half, and this is sharp shown by the family when we gather all the set subsets of size n half. And this result was extended by or generalized by Erdős. So this time we do allow some, contain, some pairs in containment. What we do not allow is um, a nested sequence of k plus one uh, sets, also called a k, k plus one chain or a chain of length k plus one. So in this case, Erdős determined the maximum number of sets that we can put uh, to a family without having these, uh, these forbidden um, configuration. And similarly to Sperner's result, what one should do to, op uh, to obtain the best family is to take um, sets of only, of, of only k possible uh, set sizes. And uh, the set size, to maximize this, one has to take the set sizes around the middle, so around n half. Uh, so this so the, the extremal number is going to be the sum of the k largest binomial coefficients. Okay, and then, um, so what the way how, so there are lots of applications to both of these theorems and there are lots of generalizations. And one generalization is due to Jussi Cotton and Tomasz Tarjan from the early 1980s. And um, the way how they viewed these two results that there are some forbidden containment patterns here. Sperner's theorem that forbids any kind of containment and Erdős's theorem uh, forbids the containment pattern of a chain, of a, k, of a chain of length k plus one. So how one can generalize this? So the, these forbidden containment patterns are described by, described by post sets in the following way. So here on the left-hand side uh, of this picture, you see the V poset uh, consisting of three elements, one at the bottom and two larger than that, and the blue element and the green element, they are incomparable. And so how this poset can be realized by sets? Well, here are two examples, actually. One example, the, probably the more natural one, is that for the red one, we have a very small set, and this is contained in both the blue set and the green set. Well, this is done also here. The difference between the two uh, pictures here that here we have the extra containment that the blue one is also contained in the green one. Well, it's a matter of taste whether you consider this as a problem or not. But whatever we have here is that whenever there is a containment, I mean, there is, there is, there is a relation in the post set, there should be a containment among the appropriate sets. And uh, the difference between these two um, uh, pictures or these two um, configurations of sets is that here we only have containment exactly when there is relation in the post set and here there are some additional ones. And so therefore we distinguish between two um, uh, notions. This is something that is called an induced copy of this post set, it sets, and this is a non-induced copy uh, of these post sets. And here are the formal definitions. Okay, so now we can say that a family of sets is P-free if it doesn't contain um, any, a non-induced copy of P, and it's induced P-free if it doesn't contain any induced copy of P. Okay, and so the extremal problem is to uh, determine the maximum size of a P-free family of, or of an induced P-free family uh, in a ground set of size N. And this is denoted in the non-induced case by LA and P, LA for largest, and with a star for the induced case. So it will be the same for, for the saturation problems. Whenever you see a star, that is for the induced problem. And whenever there is no star in the, for, in the formula, then 
it is for the non-induced problem. Okay, so with this notation, uh, Erdős's theorem just says, <coughs> sorry, that, uh, well, of course, then for chains, there is no difference between induced and non-induced because all, uh, all elements of the chain are related. So therefore all um, sets should be in containment. Um, so the LA function and the LA star function are the same. And according to Erdős's theorem, so C sub K plus one is the chain of, sorry, of length K plus one. Um, then, uh, and this is the extreme of number. Okay. Um, a couple of words about what do we know for the extreme of a problem, and then we move on to the, to the saturation problem. So um, because any poset on K elements is a non-induced subposet of a chain of length K, so therefore, Erdős's result implies this bound for any poset P. Um, so because we know that for an empty chain or any, for any poset that, that contains at least two comparable elements, an empty chain is a, f, um, is a family that doesn't contain um, that particular poset. So we, for any P, um, we can have a P-free family of size and choose and half. So therefore, it immediately gives the correct order of magnitude of the of this LA function of the extreme of function. Uh, but this is not an, an immediate consequence of Erdős's result or of any other result for the star for the induced version. So this was just recently proved by Abhishek Metuku and Demeter Pavelgi that the same uh, order of magnitude is true. So the induced extreme of function is also an or in the order of magnitude of two of n choose and half, no matter what um, uh, the forbidden poset P is. Of course, the constant depends on, on P. Okay, um, so we know the order of magnitude, but we don't know in general whether the limit exists. So it's an open problem, both in the induced and both in the non-induced case. Okay, um, conjecture. So for lots of the, uh, for many posets or for many classes of posets, the, the extremal function is known either precisely or asymptotically, but it is a wide open uh, problem for in general, but there is a conjecture that is believed uh, widely or in general uh, among people who, who uh, deal with these kinds of problems. And the conjecture is that actually to get the optimum, get a maximum sized or an asymptotically maximum sized family, one has to take whatever Erdős did for chains. So what did Erdős do? A reminder, he took to uh, uh, avoid chains of length k plus one. He took only uh, sets from k levels, sets of out of k possible size. Um, and to, to maximize the number of sets uh, that we can get via this construction, we had to take middle levels. And now the general construction is that take as many middle levels as you can without creating a non-induced copy or an induced copy, but depending on whether you are in the induced or non-induced case. And whatever you get there is going to be the asymptotically optimal. Okay, so this is what uh, the conjecture says. Okay, so that's it, uh, the, what we have, or what I wanted to say about the extremal problem. And now let's look at the, the saturation version, the real topic of today's talk. Um, so we will be interested in these two functions, the set and the set star function. So the non-induced saturation and the sa uh, induced saturation function. So what we are looking for is the minimum size of a p-free family for this time i'm talking about the non-induced case so a p, uh, the minimum size of a p-free family is such that uh, whenever i add a set that doesn't belong to this family then after adding this new set there will be a copy of p created, a non-induced copy of p created and if i change non-induced to induced then i get the the induced saturation function Okay, so let's uh, recap the history of this problem. What 
do we know already about this problem? So it started about 10 years ago when with Donny Gerdner, Balázs Kesszeg, Nathan Lemons, Corey Palmer, and Demeter Pavelgyi, we observed that, well, the simplest post sets are of course chains, totally ordered set. So we observed that if we consider the chain of length K, then here's a construction, take, and it works for any N, so take, small sets, small sets in the sense that take the first k minus three elements of, of your ground set and take all the subsets of this part of the ground set and take their complement. Well, here we have two to the k minus three elements and their complements so all together that's two to the k minus two and our claim was, or what we observed that this family, I will show you in a minute, uh, that this family is actually CK saturating, which means that there is a bound on the saturation number and again because we are talking about chains so therefore this the non-induced and the induced saturation number for this particular process it, there is no difference between the two but in any case uh, so what we observed via this construction is that there is a, a constant bound that doesn't depend on the size of the underlying set so why is it a good construction well, I need to show you two things first of all that this construction doesn't contain a chain of length k well how this family looks like. Well, I have this small part here, the first k minus three elements and all its subsets. And I have their complements. So their complements, they all contain whatever I have here in this large interval. So all the elements from k minus two to k minus two to n. And of course, what whatever I want to have here, I can have that because I just take the complement res uh, with respect to here. And then by definition, my set, is, uh, my set is there. So basically this construction is just the Boolean lattice on K minus two elements because this part behaves just as one big element if you wish. So this construction is post-set isomorphic to two to the K minus two. So therefore it contains only chains of length K minus one. So that's why um, <clears throat> we don't have a copy of a K chain in this construction. So this is half of the thing. Now I have to show that, okay, it doesn't contain chains of length K, but if I add any new set, then it will contain uh, a K chain. So why is that so? So let's add this green set H and let's partition H into two parts. The part here in the first part in among the first K minus three elements and the rest. So what do we know about these two parts? Well, I don't know anything about the first part, but what I do know about the second part is that it's neither empty and nor the whole interval here. Why is that so? Because if it was empty or if it was the whole interval, then it would be actually in the family because all those sets are in F. So because this is a newly added set, so it's, it's neither empty nor the whole interval. Okay, now what I do is, okay, let's consider now the first part of this green set. Uh, H1 and in here among the blue sets, let's create a maximal chain until H1. Then I add insert my green set. I add the appropriate red element or red set, meaning that I now take here all the elements. This is part of my family, so I can do that. And from then on, I just uh, take a max maximal chain until the whole underlying set. And if you count, that is going to be uh, a chain of length K. So this is how I show that, or how one can show that um, uh, <clears throat> the addition of any new set would create uh, a K chain in this construction. Okay, so this shows that for the K chain, the saturation number, actually it's independent of N or there is a bound that doesn't, an upper bound that doesn't depend on N. So how sharp is it? this construction. Well, as long as K is not more than six, then this is the truth. But even the six of us were able to show a better construction, a little bit better construction for larger Ks. Uh, uh, so we, obta uh, we obtained a, a better construction by a ratio of 15 over 16, but then some more clever people came. So a year later, at least this is the time when the papers appeared. So Maurice and Noel and Scott, they proved that as k tends to infinity, um, 
the exponent can be uh, decreased from about k to something definitely smaller than k, so something like 0 0.98 times k. Okay, so probably this is one of the most in interesting uh, questions in the, among these saturation problems, to find the coefficient of k in the exponent for the saturation number of, of, um, of the k chain. Okay, so what else was, uh, was done before? So there is, a, there is a paper by seven people, so even more than, than the six uh, authors paper that we had. So the authors are Ferrer, Kay, Kramer, uh, Martin, Reininger, Smith, and Sullivan. And what they did is that they considered only the, the induced saturation problem for specific posets and some nice classes of posets. And uh, they found that they, as opposed to the K chain, uh, they tend to infinity as the, the ground set is increased. Um, and they also, so this was the major part of their work, but for all the posets they considered, they always um, uh, noted that the non-induced saturation version is trivially somehow there's a constant bound that is independent on the, of, the, of the size of the ground set. Okay, then uh, last year there was a manuscript uh, uploaded to archive by Martin, Smith, and Walker. They improved some of the lower bounds that were obtained here. And then just a couple of days before our manuscript went online on archive, um, a Romanian PhD student from Cambridge, Ivan, she showed uh, better lower, even better lower bounds for two particular posets. Again, for the induced saturation function, so one poset is the butterfly poset, I will talk about it later, and the other one is the, is the end poset. Okay, so this is, at least as far as, uh, as I'm concerned, these are all the known results on uh, saturation forbidden subposet problems, but if you are aware of others, then please send it to me. Okay, so what are our results? So the main result, on, well, I will show you some non-induced, or at least one non-induced result and, and uh, one or two uh, induced results. Okay, so uh, about the non-induced results. So basically it says that the people from the previous slide, they were absolutely right not to consider non-induced versions because they are always, I mean, this is always bounded by a constant. So the saturation function, the non-induced saturation function, no matter what the poset P is, it's always bounded by a function of the size of the, of the poset. So it's, but this is all what it depends on. So it's independent of, uh, of, uh, of the size of the ground set. And okay. So uh, my first remark is that this is relatively sharp. So if we replace this part here by a K, meaning that uh, we are now looking at posets of size of, of, on K elements, um, then the exponential upper bound cannot be improved by much because uh, the lower bound that we had uh, on the, for, the, for the chain of size K. So um, what is for sure that, this that in worst case, the saturation function can be uh, exponential and it cannot be larger because of this new theorem of ours. Okay, and what we conjectured based on this result of ours and based on uh, this lower bound uh, from several years ago, that probably among all K element posets, the hardest to saturate is the, is the chain. So this is a conjecture that uh, we think to be true. We have no idea how to prove that, but anyway. Okay, uh, so actually I will show you the proof of this theorem. So let's start. So the way how it goes, we will use the, what we call the greedy collex algorithm. And even if you understand all three words, which I assume most of you do, then it's actually, it's not going to be exactly what you, what you would expect. So what's a greedy algorithm? For a greedy algorithm, in the, 
order the, uh, the, the sets of the underlying, the subsets of the underlying set. So if the, the underlying set has size n, then there are two to the n of them. So we have some order f and for the subsets f1, f2, and so on up to f to the f sub two to the n. And we set our family at the beginning to be empty. And then we treat the subsets one by one. We want to add them unless, of course, they create a copy of P because what we are aiming at is to create a, such a P saturating family, meaning that it shouldn't contain a co any copy of P, but with adding a new subset, there should be always created a, a copy of P. So what we do in this greedy algorithm at whenever we consider the I plus first uh, set, then we look at whether together with the already obtained family, whether it's still P free, if it is, then we add this new set. If it's not, so there is a, a copy of P, then we don't add it and we move on to the, to the next set. So at the very end, when we do this for all the two to the n many subsets, at the very end, of course, we get a, a P saturating family. Why is that so? Because, well, we were um, cautious enough to avoid all copies of P because if there was a copy, then of course the it consists of several subsets and the one that was added last, it shouldn't have been added. So that's why it is P-free and it's P-saturating because one uh, all the subsets that were not added, they were not added for a reason because together with some of some subsets in the family, they would create a P. So that's why this is P-saturating. Okay, so this holds for any kind of greedy algorithm. And of course the, important part is this sum. So I have two to the n factorial many possible orders to choose from and will, of course, I will take the collex order or something related to that. So what is the collex ordering? Um, well, it's about, I mean, we can order finite subsets of the positive integers in the following way. For two sets, A and B, we look at the uh, symmetric difference of the two sets, and we look at the maximal element, the largest element of this uh, symmetric difference. And if it belongs to B, then B is the larger. If it belongs to A, then A is the larger. So let's have an example. So if A is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and B is 2, 5, 8, 9, then the symmetric difference is 1, 3, 7, and 2, and 8. Out of these numbers, 8 is the largest. So among these two, sets b is the larger in the collexicographic ordering so how does the collexicographic ordering look like so the smallest set or the smallest element of this ordering is the empty set then singleton one singleton two one two singleton three one three two three and so on so this is how the collexicographic ordering looks like and as i already warned you this is not the ordering that we will consider but instead we will do the following. Uh, we will consider the collex ordering, but only on the first half of the set. So that means uh, we take those sets, they will be denoted by Fs, uh, that do not contain the largest element N of the ground set. And then we order them ac according to this collexicographic order. And for any I between one and two to the N minus one, GI is just the complement. So G1 is the complement of F1, G2 is the complement of F2. So basically there we just reverse the order. And then the order that we are going to consider looks like this. I take the very first element of the collex order and then its complement. Then the second element of the collex order and then the complement. And the third element of the collex order and then the complement and so on. So in particular, we'll have two to, two to the N minus uh, one many pairs and they are uh, ordered according to their F set in the collex ordering and the G's, they are, they are just the complements and they are considered immediately after their, their counterparts. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. Okay, so let's, let's see how, I mean, what's the order for, for, um, uh, for the subset. So we start with the empty set, then it's complement, so the whole underlying set. Then we take singleton one and it's complement, singleton two and it's complement the pair one, two, and its complement. And the last pair to consider 
is the interval from one to n minus one and its complement, which is just the singleton n. So this is the last set, uh, last subset of our ground set that we that we consider in this uh, algorithm. Okay. So this is just a formal repetition of this. Uh, the only difference here that instead of indexing the families uh, one by one for every subset, I here indexed it by by pairs, meaning that instead of having two to the n many steps in the algorithm, we have just half of that two to the n minus one because we have one family for for each pair. Okay, so our claim is that no matter what p is, so remember, so the greedy the, the greedy collex process says that do this greedy thing with this order, meaning that the first set is the empty set, then its complement then the singleton one, then its complement, and so on. And if we do it for a post set P on K element, so that means that we add the set if it doesn't create an in, a non-induced copy of P, and if it does, then we don't add it. And if, it, if this post set P contains K elements, then actually we could stop our process after pair number two to the k minus three. So all the remaining ones, no matter what n is, so no matter how large n is, most of the pairs will be untouched. So after the pair two to the k minus three, nothing will be added. And then of course, because in every pair there are two sets, so it's two times two to the k minus three, so we will have this bound two to the k minus two, which was promised at the, at the theorem. Um, okay, so think about it, what are the first two to the k minus three pairs? Well, actually, it's just the construction that I showed you to be uh, chain saturating, chain of length k. So this is exactly the construction that we had for uh, in the 2013 paper with Donny Gardner and others. Um, so it says that somehow this is a, well, I wouldn't say universal construction, but anyway, is that this is a construction uh, which is saturating for the chain and which con for which contains a saturating family for any other uh, k element for set p. Okay, so how will the proof go? So here's a hint. So suppose that we are doing the greedy collex process, and at some moment we are considering this one element set L plus one, say. Uh, that's the only element of the set. And suppose that the greedy collex process doesn't add this set to the, uh, to, uh, to the family because it creates uh, a copy of, of P, whatever P is. We, together, of course, uh, with, the, with those sets that are already added uh, to our family. So can we say something about other sets just based on the fact that this singleton is not added. For example, can we say something about the next singleton or can we say something about this pair that comes after uh, L plus one? So this is well, what I wrote here is L plus five and L plus 17. So this black pair is for this set and this purple point is for, for this uh, singleton set. Well, I claim that if this one was not added, then neither will be uh, added these two sets. So why is that so? Uh, because let's look at all those sets that were considered so far in the greedy collex process. Well, this is a set, a singleton, that doesn't contain the largest element, so this is an F. So what are the sets that were considered so far? Well, those sets that are that precedes this singleton in the collex order. And what are those? Well, they are the subsets of the first L elements of the ground set. So these are denoted by blue, so they are all living. Uh, they all live in here, and of course they're complements. So they, and how do the complements look like? Well, we have something here, and we have all the elements from here. And what we need to observe that with respect to these, the green dot and the purple dot, or the pair of the black dots, they behave just the same. They are not in containment relation with any of these, and they are all contained this one, this one, and this one, by all of these red guys. So it doesn't make a difference whether I want to add this one or this one or this pair. If this one creates a copy of the forbidden post set P, then so will the other two. So if this is not added, then I won't be able to add these two either. Okay, 
Uh, so this is the observation. And the next lemma, um, maybe I will skip the proof, but the next lemma says something in the counter positive, meaning that, so here what I said that if this is not added, then these two, uh, these two sets are not going to be added either. So now I will say that if something is added, then something else before was added too. And so, as I said, I skipped the proof, but I will show you the four statements, small statements of the lemma. So what kind of uh, uh, things are there? Uh, okay, so maybe, I, okay, so this is important. So M i, M sub i denotes the largest element of the, of the set F sub i. So the first statement of the lemma, so if I have a set in my family, the, born in the collex, uh, greedy collex order or greedy collex process, it was added and this is its maximum element. Then if I remove this maximal element and I obtain this other set that was also added before. This is the first statement. And then the second statement says that again, I have an F meaning I, uh, this set doesn't contain the largest element. Again, the red dot signals the largest element of this set. And then if I add all the elements coming after, so this interval here, then again, it was picked before. Statement number three is now the last two statements are about uh, Gs. That means sets that do contain the last element N. So how do we get, of course, uh, how do we realize that which element is M sub i? Well, M sub i is the largest element of F sub i and G sub i is the complement. So these blues, this blue set is now the complement of F sub i. So that means that M sub i is the largest element that is missing from here. So number, statement number three says that if I have such a set, that is added at some point of the greedy collex process, then if I uh, put there the largest element missing, then this was already added in the family. And the last statement is that, okay, again, we start with the set G sub i, so it contains the largest element, and I consider or I remove this last interval. So whatever we have before, uh, not having an element here. And if I remove this part, then again, this set was added before uh, in, in a, so, uh, in a pre, at the previous step of the process, this set was added. If this was added, then this was added too. Okay, so how to finish the proof of, this, uh, of the theorem using these four statements? Um, so what do we need to prove? We need to prove that nothing after the two to the k minus third pair will be added. So suppose there is something that is, uh, uh, that is added. So I have, again, two options, either H is an F or H is a G, meaning that either H contains the largest element N or A, and then it's a G, or it doesn't contain, and then it's an F. So I will only consider, I will only show you the, the first case when H is a subset supposedly added after the first two to the k minus three many pairs and still it doesn't contain uh, the element n so then what well so this is f sub i uh its elements are h1 h2 and so on hl so this is the largest one so this is m sub i with the notation of the previous slides and what do we know about uh, m sub i we know that uh, Sorry about this. So we know that um, this is at least, or it's, it's strictly larger than k minus three. Why is it so? Because of this uh, uh, condition that the, we know that the first two to the k minus three many pairs, they, uh, they have all the subsets of the first k minus three elements. So if we have a pair coming later and we consider its f, f version, then its largest element is strictly larger than k minus three, and it is strictly smaller than n because it's an f set, so it doesn't contain n. Okay, um, then what do we do? Then we apply 
statement number one of the lemma, we apply it multiple times, actually L times. So we first remove the largest element, then we remove the second largest element and so on. And based on the statement of the lemma, they are all in our family. So that means we obtained a chain of length L plus one already. Okay, so far so good. Then what? Then we want to apply statement number two, which says that, okay, this blue part is the set that I, uh, that was supposed to be added. Then, uh, then we know that this is an F. So that means I can add whatever comes after the, its largest element. So I do, and this newly obtained set, it's also, it is also in the family. Okay. And then what? And then uh, starting from this set, I can apply statement number three and add the missing elements one by one, starting from the largest one, second largest one, and so on, up till I fill in all the, uh, all the elements and I get the whole underlying set. And a little bit of thinking gives me that the number of sets here is M sub I, so this is this element minus L, so the number of green dots here plus one, because I go from zero to M sub I minus L. Uh, so this is a chain and I can put together these two chains, L plus uh, chain of length L plus one, chain of length this much. And all together, what I get is a chain of length M sub I plus two, but M sub I is strictly larger than K minus three. So that means M sub I plus two is at least K. So that means that if I added such a set after the first k uh, two to the k minus three many pairs, then actually the the family of the uh, greedy collects process contains a chain of length k. Now, so far everything I said is valid both for the non-induced and the induced case. And now comes my last sentence about this proof: is that I have a contradiction, but only in the non-induced case. Why is that so? Because any k element poset p is a subposet, a non-induced subposet of the chain of length k. Of course, it's not true for uh, for the induced version. There we have nothing, and there is no contradiction. But in this way, so because we have now, so our contradictory assumption was that we indeed added something after this uh, two to the k minus third first uh, pairs. And then we obtain the contradiction that, okay, but then we have a K chain, which is impossible because every K chain uh, contains actually uh, any poset P of, on K elements. Uh, and we know that the greedy collects process doesn't create any copy of P, so now we have a contradiction. Well, of course, if you believe me that the other case when, uh, when the added set H is, um, is not an F, but a G, but it's very similar. So I hope you believe me. Okay, so this is the proof of the uh, non-induced results. We have several other results in the paper. So uh, for non-induced results for specific um, uh, post sets where the bound is not just a general bound, but um, either we have the, the precise saturation number or something very close to it. Uh, but now let me move on to uh, to the induced results that we obtained. Um, so as I said, the greedy collects algorithm can be defined for the induced case. The proof, what I told you, it doesn't work. We know that it doesn't work because I mean the result would have given us would have given us that uh, the saturation function is bounded by a constant independent of n of the size of the ground set, and we know it from earlier results of uh, of, uh, of many people that there are post sets for which the induced saturation function tends to infinity with n with the size uh, size of the ground set. So we can't expect that, but maybe but still we can look at how the greedy collects algorithm works in the induced case. Well, actually, it's not that good. I will show you. Uh, and we could be interested that how, what, what, can, uh, what can this um, process do when, when we know that the saturation function uh, tends to infinity. But before that, let me, let me show you a lemma, uh, which is actually implicit in the work of uh, Ferrara and others. 
So it gives us a kind of a characterization that when is the induced saturation function is bounded by a constant that is independent of n. So these two things are equivalent. First, that the induced saturation function is bounded by a constant independently of the size of the underlying set. And the fact that one is able to find a p-saturating family such that on a ground, si uh, ground set of size m and two elements, x and y, in the ground set, such that they are not separated by the saturating family. What does it mean set, uh, se uh, being separated? Well, this blue rectangle, it separates x and y because it contains x and doesn't contain y. So separation means that it, a set separates two elements if it contains one of them but not the other. So not separating means that it doesn't separate these two particular elements, meaning that every set in the family either contains both of them or none of them. Okay, so the proof actually is quite simple. First, I mean, there are two directions because this is an equivalent statement. Uh, so Two follows from one simply by the fact that we know that to separate all pairs of elements of a ground set of size m, we need at least log m many sets. So if we uh, if we um, um, if we do if we yeah if we if we have only a, a family of of a constant size, then for large enough m it won't be able to separate because this log m will surpass this constant. Okay, the other direction is a, it's just an observation. So, well, um, if f does not separate x and y, then f consists, the, the family consists of two parts. Now those sets that don't contain I, neither x nor y, and those sets that contain both of them. And so, well, this family, we have it only for a ground set of size m, but based on this family, we can extend it to arbitrary larger ground sets in this way. So I keep those sets that do not contain x and y, and to these sets, I add the new elements. So if I, instead of a ground set of size m, I have now a larger ground set n, then all the new elements will be added to all of these sets, and it's not hard to verify that the uh, that the family that I obtained in this way is p-saturating again. Okay. So anyway, so this is the statement. The statement is that the induced saturation number is bounded by a constant if and only if there is a p-saturating family that is not separating. Now, what are the consequences of this lemma? Um, but first of all, our first consequence is that there is a dichotomy uh, phenomenon, meaning that the saturation, the induced saturation function is at, is either at most a constant, or it is at least log of n. So you cannot, no matter what is your favorite poset p, it cannot happen that the order of magnitude of the induced saturation uh, function is say log log n or inverse Ackermann or anything like that. It always should be at least log of n. And actually, what we conjecture that is far from truth. Uh, we conjecture that either the, the induced saturation function is a constant or it's at least linear. Uh, second consequence. Second consequence is that to decide that whether uh, the induced saturation number of, of a post set is bounded by a constant that doesn't depend on, on the ground set size, uh, this problem is recursively enumerable because all what we do is just greedily, well, for every n, we check that uh, we check all families whether they are saturating, and if they are saturating, then we also check whether they do not separate a particular pair. And if we find that, then that is a proof based on the lemma that uh, the, the, the induced saturation number is bounded. So we have a, a proof for boundedness, but we don't have a proof for being unbounded. So it's a question that whether this problem is recursive, whether there is an algorithm that decides for any post set P whether the saturation number is bounded by a constant or it grows uh, with, with the size of the underlying set. Okay, consequence number three. So now back to the greedy uh, collex process. 
what one can do, okay, take your favorite pose set P and uh, a size for the ground set, hopefully not very large, or if you have a very strong computer or quick computer, then it can be even larger. Uh, and then look whether the last two elements, n minus one and n are not separated or, or whether they are separated or not. And if they are not, that's good news based on the lemma, because then we know that this is bounded. Uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the induced saturation function is bounded. Of course, it's, there is no guarantee that just because the greedy collex doesn't find um, uh, the appropriate family to prove that it's bounded, it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that it's unbounded, but uh, um, this is what we have. So I'm, okay. So yeah, if if it if it um, <clears throat> if it does separate, then we then it then nothing follows. And yet, when the greedy uh, collex algorithm can be useful, even in cases when this when the induced saturation function tends to infinity. And let me show you this. Well, showing me it's a, it's a, quite an exaggeration. I will just hint what's going on. So the butterfly pose set it it has four elements a, b, c, and d. So a, B, they are the two small elements, and C and D, they are the two upper elements. So C and D, they are both larger than A and B, and no other uh, relation in there. And <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, we run the greedy collects for P, and we get a long list of sets, and they do separate N minus one and N, so there is no chance that uh, it's going to be bounded, not to mention the fact that there are lower bounds, so we know that it won't uh, separate this n minus one and n, um, and then I know that this is hard to take. Or I mean, so anyway. So after looking at the listed sets for a while, one can get actually the structure of what of what's going on, of what the the output, uh, what the structure of the output family is. Basically, it looks like or almost like six maximal chains. So the size of the output is always going to be six and minus 10. And what one can do is, well, once we um, have a hint by the computer and therefore a conjecture for what the, uh, the collex greedy process gives, then we can prove it mathematically or use by, via induction, of course, that this is indeed the output of, uh, of the greedy collex process. And then we immediately obtain an upper bound of six and minus 10 for this butterfly pose set. And luckily, just a couple of the, uh, days before our uh, manuscript went onto archive, uh, this uh, talented uh, PhD student from Cambridge showed a linear lower bound. So now we have the CRM that uh, the saturation, the induced saturation function of this particular process is linear in terms of the size of the ground set. Okay, so if this went so well, then of course one can ask whether this greedy collex process always gives the correct order of magnitude. And the answer is no. We have counterexamples, unfortunately. So two times C3, this is, well, C3 is the C3 is the chain of length three. So two C3 is just a pair of chains of length three that are incomparable to each other. Uh, so the, the, the chain relations are the only relations that are there. And for that, seemingly the greedy collex process gives a quadratic family, uh, but we had an, a linear upper bound. And even worse, we had, I won't define this diamond-like uh, um, pose set, but we have a, an example for which the greedy collex process gives a family that, ha, that has an exponential size uh, with respect to the size of the ground set. And actually it is not, it wasn't very hard to find a, a linear uh, family, a linear upper bound. But still we do not have a counter example for separating um, constant and non-constant. So it is still possible that the greedy collex process uh, is good just to decide whether this induced saturation number is a constant or not. Um, of course, I wouldn't bet on this, but I just say that we don't have a counter example for that. Okay, uh, I'm getting closer to the end, but I want to show you one more, 
result or, or conjecture. And uh, just to show you that how little do we know about um, uh, the induced saturation number. So uh, there were already um, uh, satisfying conditions for, for the saturation function not to be bounded. We extended, so we added some more, and we also had uh, satisfying conditions for uh, for uh, having the saturation number bounded, but we still do not understand what is going on. And here is the simplest thing that, at least personally, I don't really understand why is this like that. Uh, so this is uh, a post set on 2K elements. They are just K pairs. So this one is smaller than this one. This element is smaller than this element, and so on. So if you wish, then the Hasse, this post set is the one of which the Hasse diagram is a, is a matching of size k. And we conjecture, because this is what we obtained from computers or whatever, that, uh, that the fact that whether this, the induced saturation function of this post set is bounded by a constant independently of the ground set size or not, that depends on the parity of k. How many edges do we have in the matching? So if k is odd, then it is bounded according to our conjecture. If it's even, then it's unbounded. At least this is what we conjecture. Um, so what do we have? Um, for odd, so for positive results in the sense that uh, then it's bounded. Um, well, for k equals one, you just take the empty set or you take the, uh, the, the whole ground set and that would give you a, a saturating family. But for k equals three and five, we had some nice uh, constructions and then we were very happy and so that it would work for, for larger values of k. So, I mean, the construction was about, or it involved circular intervals. So we, instead of looking at the elements one to n as an interval, we just close the interval and get the circle. So n was a neighbor of one and so on. And then we have the circular intervals, uh, consecutive element uh, integers. And using these, we managed to come up with a, a non-separating family and we conjecture that this is going to be saturated if we pick every parameter appropriately, then this is going to be saturating for this uh, KC2 post set. And as I said, it did work for K equals three and five, but it didn't work for K equals seven. And at that moment, we saw that, okay, then probably K, and, K equals one, three and five were outliers. And then from then on, everything will be unbounded. But then we had the greedy collapse process and it worked for seven. So now we conjecture that it should be like that for every value, every odd value of k, but I mean, just because of that. So what do we know about the even case? Well, it's even worse, the even case, because all we have is that we can prove that for k equals two, uh, it is indeed unbounded. So actually this is the theorem that we have, that um, if we have uh, a two C2, uh, saturating uh, family, then um, uh, then it must contain a maximal chain uh, in the ground set. So therefore, it should have at least n plus one sets. Uh, the upper bound to n is just if you take a maximal chain and add all the singletons, that's uh, two n many sets, and you can check by hand that this is two C two uh, uh, saturating. So I will show you. Uh, in the hopefully in like five minutes that's how this proof goes okay so what we want to do is that we introduce um, uh, the downset of g with respect to the family f so these are i mean this is a another family of sets um, all this all the all the sets in the family f that are strict subsets of g so why are why is it meaningful? Because just not, not even saturating, just the fact that uh, a family is 2C2 free, that it doesn't contain an induced copy of, of uh, two pairs, two comparable pairs, uh, that can be described using these downsets. Why? So we claim that if we have a 2C2, free, an induced 2C2 free 
family, then if we take f and f prime in the family and look at their downsets, then either one contains the other or the other contains the first one, or well, they can be of course the same, and then both contain the other. Why is that so? Because if not, then if uh, the downset of f prime doesn't contain the, the downset of f, then there is a d which is below f, but not below f prime. And if uh, the downset of f doesn't contain the downset of f prime, then there is a d prime, which is just below f prime, but not below f. And then these four sets, they indeed form an induced copy of two uh two pairs in containment so this is one pair this is the other okay so based on that if we have a family f which is 2c2 free then using the downsets we can order them namely in such a way that they form a nested sequence so the first one has the largest downset, then the second one, the next largest, and so on. So they are nested. Of course, repetitions are allowed. So that it can happen that the downsets are the same. Uh, but definitely, there is, a, there is a, a nestedness here. And of course, we can assume that the whole ground set and the empty set is added because they are comparable to all the subsets of the ground set. So they wouldn't form. Uh, wouldn't help to form an induced copy of 2C2 uh, because uh, because in 2C2 we need four elements. For each of them, there are at least two other which is not comparable to that. And well, for the whole ground set, it is, and for the empty set, it is impossible. So therefore, we have to add. If you want to saturate, then we have to add them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so then we ordered the elements of the family f in this way and then we define the g's so it's g sub j is the intersection of the first j sets of the family in the previously um, uh, determined order so well here a red dot is missing then for the second one it's still the same and for the third one so this one is supposed to be the intersection of this set this set and this set and this is of course uh well in my ugly drawing this is the Hasse diagram of the of the boolean lattice this is the complete of so the ground set and this here is the empty set and then this guy is the intersection of this this and this and this one is the intersection of this 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 and this and this and finally we get there and so the claim will be that okay now we defined the red ones the red sets the g's and the claim is that well, they form a set, I mean, they form a chain, not necessarily a maximal chain, but because we intersected more and more sets, then of course we have smaller and smaller sets. And the claim is that whatever is in between two consecutive elements, then they should belong, if F is 2C2 saturating, then these sets should belong to the family. This is what I'm going to prove. And, um, uh, okay, so here we need a lemma. So remember, the Fs are the original sets in the family and the Gs are the intersections. And the claim is that, okay, um, of course the Gs, the intersections might, might be much smaller than the original sets, but the downsets, they are relatively the same. So the only thing that could happen that we, the GH loses from its downset, well, itself, because GH, it contains itself, but not strictly, so therefore it's not there. That, so this is uh, this is the statement of the claim. Well, the first part, this part, is easy because uh, uh, G H is just the intersection of all the uh, uh, the first H F sets. So in particular, it is a subset of F sub H. So clearly, the downset of a larger set contains the downset of the smaller set. So there is basically nothing to prove here. On the other hand, so for this other containment, we have. Um, uh, now we use the fact that uh, this is a 2C2 free family. So therefore we had this nestedness. So the way how we enumerated um, the sets of the family, we have that the downsets are nested. So for every I, which is smaller uh, than H, the downset of F sub I contains the downset of F sub H. So it, therefore the downset of, of F sub H is actually the intersection of the downsets of the first H uh, downset. And therefore, 
uh, because what is GH? Well, GH is just the intersection of all the uh, of all the FIs. So whatever is um, so this means that here we have all the sets that are below all the FIs. Well, if, so, if something is below all the FIs, then it's below all the GA. I mean, it's below GH. Well, below means that it can be actually equal. So the only thing that is missing from here is GH itself. So this uh, set, I mean, this finishes the proof of this claim. Okay, and now, so remember, this is what I want to show that we define this uh, this chain, and I want to show that whatever is in between two consecutive elements of the chain, that it, it should also belong to F. And if that is so, then we indeed get that the um, <clears throat> the, the family F contains a maximal chain, and therefore it size at least n plus one. Okay, so this is, I think, the last slide of the talk. So I need to show, as I said, that if I have a set X, which is a subset of G sub J, maybe it is indeed G sub J, and it is a strict superset of G sub J plus one, then it should belong to F. So towards the contradiction, suppose it doesn't, it, it doesn't belong. Then if it doesn't belong, now I use the fact this for the first time, I think that, uh, that F is 2C2 saturating. So if I add X to this family, then an induced copy of this post set should be born. So that means, well, X must be part of that induced copy. So that means the other pair is incomparable to X. So the other pair A and B, they should come from the family F. Okay, well, A and B from the family F, that means that they are some FK and sub FL. And because A is a subset of B, therefore B is listed first. So its index is smaller than the index of A. And now we have two cases. And this time I will show you both cases because they fit on this slide. So the first case is when the index of B L is at most J. So at most this J that we are talking about. Uh, so then what do we have? Well, X is a subset of G sub J. Well, what's the definition of G sub J? It's the intersection of all the previous FIs. In particular, FL is one of them and FL is B, meaning that B contains X, which is a contradiction because X and B are not supposed to be in containment relation. So for this case, I got my contradiction. And for the other case, when L is at least J plus one, then I will apply the claim. And I will get a contradiction with the fact that A and X are supposed to be incomparable. So what is A? Well, A is a subset of B and B has a spy name F sub L. So in particular, A is a member of the downset of F sub L. And because the Fs are nested, I mean, the downsets of the Fs are nested, and we are in the case L is at least J plus one, we have this containment. Now I use the claim. According to the claim, the downset of F sub J plus one is contained in the downset of G uh, sub J plus one plus J, G sub J sub plus one itself. But, Whatever is below G sub J plus one, it's of course below X. And even G sub J plus one is also below X. So that means that A is below X. So indeed, A is a subset of X, which is a contradiction because they are not supposed to be comparable. So I obtained the contradiction in both cases. So the proof is, uh, is, is done. It's finished. So um, that's all I wanted to show you. And as a reminder from Demeter, there is a nice table uh, in our manuscript that we uploaded to archive, uh, which contains all the results that either we or the other manuscripts obtained. So if you are interested in specific um, values of, of, uh, of the saturation function, I mean, the, the value of the saturation function for specific posets or classes of posets, then you can take a look there. And uh, thank you for your attention. I would like to stop now. I don't know how we do this. So if anyone has a question, then probably there is a way, which I don't know how is it that he or she can ask this question. So I will wait for... Question? Yeah, are there... Oh. So... 
uh, many of the microphones are now on. So anyone who has a question, then uh, I'm happy to trying to answer that. Is the uh, two to the P ever sharp in the non-induced case? Uh, as I said, uh, for the, uh, that's for sure that for the, with the greedy collax algorithm, we cannot do any better because for the, for the chain, it gives exactly that much. And also, uh, if you want to be more clever and not use something else, then, uh, um, then what we know is that exponential is, at, uh, is needed because uh, we have a lower bound for, again, for the chain, which is uh, roughly k over two k minus three over two. So it's going to be exponential, whether it's, and well, the coefficient of the, of k in the exponent, we don't know. So it's somewhere between uh, one half and one, but we don't know the exact value there. But we conjecture that it's not sharp, that the chain gives the upper bound, and for that we have something better, right? 0 0.98. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if I go back, I don't know if I can do that, but let me just go back. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Morrison, Noel, and Scott, they showed this result for, uh, for the chain. Oops. So there is an improvement. Instead of 2 to the k, they have 2 to the 0 0.9. Uh, 9 8 times k and we have a conjecture as the matter mentioned uh this conjecture that the k chain is, is we the cannot hard. see the slides at least i can't oh, i'm sorry then what did i do Probably, uh, but... um okay okay so now can you now see the slides yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the conjecture. The conjecture is that uh, if you consider non-induced saturation, then what we conjecture is that the chain is the hardest to saturate. And if this conjecture is mm -hmm. true, as Demeter mentioned, then because of this result of Morrison, Noel, and Scott, then the coefficient <coughs> shouldn't be one, but something smaller. Because we know that for the chain, something smaller is true. Um, but we don't know whether our conjecture holds, but whether it's indeed the chain which is hardest to saturate. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks.